Corner Fringe Ministries presents part two on the teaching, The Seven Churches of Revelation. Enjoy. Well, we are in part two of our study of seven churches of Revelation. And we're still making our way through chapter one. I have a lot to say today because I want to actually get through the entire chapter. I might be a little bit long today. I will try to talk a little bit faster than usual. So with that said, let's get right into Revelation. Now if you remember, we ended off at verse 7 last week. So let's pick it up there. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even they who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of him, even so. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. The gravity of those first five words that John spoke, do you remember? At the very beginning of this book, to open up Revelation. It was the revelation of the Messiah Yeshua. The revelation of Jesus Christ. In other words, everything that's going to come afterwards, there is an unveiling here. There's a total unfolding. We're going to get to see aspects to Yeshua that we haven't perhaps seen before. Awesome attributes. Well, the weight of those words that he spoke right at the beginning, they are being felt right here in verse 8. Because I want to point something out here. This passage is all about the Lord Yeshua. He is the one who was was, and who is to come. Now what's so interesting about this statement, if you have good memories, is that last week we read the very same statement. Only last week... It was applied to the Father. That's the difference. I want to take you back. Revelation verse 4, chapter 1. John, to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace. From him, him meaning the Father as you're going to see, who is and who was and who is to come. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne and from Messiah Yeshua. Notice that? Now this is a very common, this is, an, this is a total typical introduction from a Jewish believer of the day. You, you read the epistles of Paul, and you'll find something to the effect of grace and peace to you from God the Father and the Lord Yeshua Mashiach. That's how he opens his epistle up generally. This is a total common theme, if you will, a way to introduce uh, your book that you're writing. But notice here, This is explicitly of the Father in verse 4. And yet, we come to verse 8, and this very same statement is now, this, this literally, this awesome title of who is, who was, and is to come, this title is being ascribed to the Lord Yeshua. And as you're going to see this, emphatically, without a doubt, verse 8 is explicitly referring to Yeshua. What is John revealing to us? What is he telling us here? Because this is awesome. Well, let me utilize the words of Yeshua himself. Going back to the Gospel of John. John chapter 10, verse 30. I and my Father are one. This is the statement. I and my Father, we are a chad. We are one. We find the deistic nature of Yeshua is being revealed here. This is the revelation of Yeshua the Messiah. This is what he is. This is who he is. This is a reality of who he really is. He did not just come in the flesh. What did John 1.1 1, 1 says? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. What an awesome revelation. Amen? And look at Yeshua's words here in John chapter 8, verse 58. Words that nearly got him stoned. Yeshua said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. A statement that can only be made by God. The Son of God. Being the Son of His Father. Let me give you one more. John 14, verse 8. Philip said to Yeshua, Lord, show us the Father, and it is sufficient for us. And Yeshua said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? The deistic nature of Yeshua was something of a primary concern to John. It is the central emphasis in the Gospel of John. 
His core emphasis throughout the gospel is to prove that Yeshua is much more than a man. And that he eternally pre-existed and all things exist because of him. The Father made all things through his Son. Well, interestingly enough, the very same emphasis is found here in Revelation. This is the emphasis that we're seeing in this prologue, if you will. Now, I'm not going to spend it, I'm not going to go any further on, on the deity of the Messiah. I, I, I exhausted this topic. If you want, you can pick up the divine nature of God's study. It's a 12-part study, very in-depth in talking about the deistic nature of Yeshua. So with that said, let's just continue in verse 9. Revelation 1.9, I, John, both your brother and companion in the tribulation and kingdom and patience of Yeshua HaMashiach was on the island that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. So John's on the island of Patmos, obviously thought to be in prison. We covered this last week. Imprisoned because of something or some things in the plural. Did you notice? Why is John on the island of Patmos? What's the description he gives for the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ? In other words, what are we seeing here? What is happening here? John just revealed those two particular statements we looked at last week. Remember, we're in Revelation 12 and Revelation 14. We find the dragons enraged with the woman goes to make war with the rest of her offspring who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of the Messiah Yeshua. Because it is on these two things that put you in a particular class of people. The elect, the very definition of what it means to be a saint, the very definition of what it means to be a disciple of Yeshua, to be the elect of God, is defined right here. Those who keep the commandments of God and have faith in the Messiah Yeshua. And this is why John is on the island of Patmos. He is being persecuted because he holds the true testimony. And remember, so what, woven throughout the tapestry of Scripture, Genesis to Revelation, all things are established on the testimony of two. Your faith is established on the testimony of two. It is your belief that Yeshua died and rose again. He is your salvation and his blood covers your sins. And it's the act of walking in righteousness. Walking in holiness. Now, John at the beginning of verse 9 here, look at this. Look at what he says. He identifies that he is a companion with the seven churches in the tribulation. So, not just him, this is plural. He is a companion with these churches, who we're going to get into next week, in the tribulation. And we know, just based off of this passage, right, the church is suffering what? Persecution. They're in tribulation. We know already in the first century, just looking at the book of Acts and onward, you had believers already being thrown out of the synagogue. You had believers being thrown into prison. Peter, Paul, John, right? You had believers that were literally being put to death for the faith. Stephen is an example. I call this by any definition, tribulation. Would you not? Now when you look at the, the, the word tribulation in the Greek, it's thelipsis. It's thelipsis. The root of that word is thelibo. Now why is this important? Thelibo means pressure. Literally, applying pressure. There's pressure coming upon the church. You read Luke 16, 16. The law and the prophets were until John. Since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. And as we know, every action has an opposite and equal reaction. And that reaction was Hasatan, the enemy, Satan, coming in like a flood to kill that gospel that was being brought out to the four corners of the globe. And we know that Hasatan, Satan himself, was literally, at this time, you go back to the first century, at this time, he was cast out of heaven. And he knows he has a short time. You find that later on in Revelation. You know, something you need to understand, it doesn't matter what generation you lived in. You can go back, all the way back to the first century, to today, it doesn't matter what generation you live in, you should have suffered tribulation. You should have suffered persecution for the faith on some level. 
Listen to what Yeshua says in John 16, verse 33. These things I have spoken to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. Be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. I believe the words of Yeshua. He set the precedence. What can we expect in this age, in this lifetime, when I'm in the flesh? What can I expect? Tribulation. That's what we can expect. Listen to the words of Paul, frightening words. In his second letter to Timothy, he says, chapter 3, verse 10, But you have carefully followed my doctrine, manner of life, life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, love, perseverance, persecutions, afflictions, which happened to me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, and out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yes, all who desire to live godly in the Messiah Yeshua will suffer persecution. Did you get that? All, everyone who desires to live godly in the Messiah Yeshua is going to suffer persecution. I want you to look closer at this last verse. Do you see what I see? We see again. The compilation of two statements woven throughout the entire tapestry of the Word. Again, we see someone clinging to the Word of God, keeping the commandments, and having the faith in Yeshua. Look at what he says. All who desire to live godly, that's righteousness. You are keeping the commandments. You are living godly in what? In the Messiah Yeshua. Meaning you're walking out these commandments because of the faith, you have placed in the Son of God. All things established on the testimony of two. And yet we find that these people who do walk godly, right, in the faith, in the faith of Messiah Yeshua, what can they expect? Persecution. It is going to happen. All those who live godly in the Messiah will suffer persecution. When looking at this statement, we're now presented with a situation, we have to ask ourselves a question. If it is true, and that all people who desire to live godly in the Messiah Yeshua, who keep the commandments and place their faith in Him, are going to suffer persecution, and we are not suffering persecution, whether from your employer, or your fellow work, uh, workmates, your fellow colleagues, your family, your intimate family, your extended family, or friends, or by the world in general, then we have to ask ourselves another question. Am I living godly in the Messiah Yeshua? Because if I'm not suffering persecution, this is a question I have to ask. If I'm not being scoffed at, if I'm not being mocked, this is something we have, we're confronted with. And I know some of you might say, oh, Daniel... We live in a Christian nation. So for us, you know, this type of stuff, it's not so prevalent. The first problem is, is we don't live in a Christian nation because Christian nations don't kill unborn children. Christian nations don't promote homosexuality. Christian nations don't promote sexual immorality on multiple levels, such as homosexuality, where we have parades going through the streets. We are anything but a Christian nation. I can assure you, now I do believe there are Christians living in this nation. I understand that. But we are not a Christian nation. And when you're not a Christian nation, you are living godly in the Messiah Yeshua. The words of Paul are going to ring true. And you are going to suffer persecution. You may even suffer persecution by fellow Christians. Just as the first century Jews suffered persecution by their own brethren in the synagogues. There's nothing new under the sun. Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5. Examine yourselves as to whether you're in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves? The Messiah Yeshua is in you. Unless indeed you are disqualified. In other words, we are to be testing ourselves to find out if we are disqualified. 1 John 2, 3. Now by this we know that we know Him. If we keep His commandments, we are to test ourselves. One of those tests, those self-tests that you can give yourself is to ask yourself, am I being persecuted? Am I being made fun of at work? Am I being mocked? Am I being spit on? Am I being beat up? 
all of these things are a reality that we are, we are confronted with. Moving on to verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I already dealt with this several weeks ago. The biblical definition of the Lord's day is none other than the Shabbat. This is the day of the Lord. This is the Lord's day. Nothing else in Scripture outside, nothing else in, in Scripture defines the Lord's day or the day of the Lord as anything but two things. The Sabbath millennial rest and reign with the Messiah and the seventh day Shabbat. It's the only things that are actually defined as the Lord's day. So here we see John, he's in the spirit, he's worshiping God on Shabbat. And I heard uh, behind me a loud voice as of a trumpet. So here John, he's worshiping the Lord on Shabbat, he hears this loud voice behind him, but he gives imagery with it. As of a trumpet. Have we ever heard this type of scenario taking place in Scripture where there is a loud voice and then the imagery of a trumpet is being used? We have. Mount Sinai. We find this very, these very imageries being used at Mount Sinai. Let me take you there. I want to show you because I actually have an, uh, an ulterior motive here. We're going to see just how applicable what was going on at Mount Sinai and what the children of Israel experienced to what John is experiencing, and not just that, but the relevance of the message. Because it's going, to, it's going to correspond to what John is dealing with. Exodus 19, verse 16. Then it came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings, a thick cloud on the mountain, and the sound of the trumpet. There's that imagery of a trumpet. It was what? Very loud. What did John mention in regard to the voice that he heard? It was loud. All right? So here it was very loud, so all the people uh, who were in the camp trembled. So here we have this scenario, the children of Israel, they're brought out of Egypt, they're brought to the foot of the mountain to enter into covenant with God, they hear the trumpet, and then what else happens? God speaks directly to his people. They audibly heard his voice. It was an awesome experience. And what did God speak to them? The commandments. He declared to them righteousness. It was a message of righteousness and repentance. This was the message that was delivered. Upon hearing this loud voice, this trumpet. And then, and then what happens afterward? God speaks to him. He shares this, this declaration of the Ten Commandments. The beautiful law of God. Then we go on to read Exodus 20 verse 18. Now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, there's that imagery, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moshe, you speak with us and we will hear, but let not God speak with us lest we die. And Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you that his fear may be before you so that you may not sin. So God, he speaks directly to Israel for the purpose of conveying a message. A message that they should repent, that they should turn, that they should not sin. That they should not do the things that they were accustomed to doing. And this is exactly what is happening in the book of Revelation. When Yeshua is speaking with John, he is giving John a message. And it's the very same message that echoes from Mount Sinai. It's the very same message. So going back to Revelation... In verse 10, we find John, he's in the Spirit on the Lord's day. He hears a loud voice as of a trumpet. And this is what the voice said. We continue. Revelation 1.11. I am the Alpha and the Omega. And in Hebrew, the Aleph Vatav. The Aleph Vatav. Meaning the beginning and the end. And here he says the first and the last. And what you see, write in a book. And send it to the seven churches which are in Asia to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamos, as we noted last time, sometimes people identify it as Pergamum, to, to Thyatira, or throughout era, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea, or Laodicea. So Yeshua, we find he comes to John here, and he instructs him that the things which are going to be revealed to him, 
He needs to write these things down in a book. And this book is actually supposed to be delivered to the seven churches as mentioned here. But as we continue, we're going to find Johnny's now going to get into a description as to what he saw regarding actually physically witnessing Yeshua, seeing him with his own eyes. Look at what he says. Then I turned to see the voice that spoke with me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. The terminology that John chooses to use here regarding Yeshua, defining him, giving the description, calling him literally one like the Son of Man. This is fascinating because what John witnesses in his vision here is the exact same thing that we find Daniel and the book of Daniel witnessing, who too was told to write these things down. And I want to take you to the book of Daniel, and I want to show you what he saw. Uh, because in the midst of this, we're going to be giving some further information, which is really going to help you appreciate the description that John is about to give us. This is going to help set the stage a little bit. And, and know that, I mean, if you've ever studied Revelation, you know that the sister book of Revelation is in fact Daniel. The sister book, I would consider them sisters, if you will. Going to Daniel 7, verse 13, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, there's the title, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. And he came to the Ancient of Days. And it's very important. Here you have one like the Son of Man. This is the Mashiach. This is the Messiah. And he literally, it says, he came to the Ancient of Days. Who's the Ancient of Days? It is the Father. The, the, the text is explicit here. This is the Father. And they brought him near before him, the Father. Then to him, meaning Yeshua, the Messiah, was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. What an awesome and intense passage. One that echoes Isaiah 9. You remember Isaiah 9? And it says, for unto us a child is born, for unto us a son is given. Of the increase of his government, there will be no end. It's eternal. It's forever. And the people are going to worship this one forever. This is who Daniel's referring to. He's referring to the Mashiach, the, the one like the Son of Man. Now, with that in mind, with the understanding of the Ancient of Days, and that is exclusive to the Father, let me back up just a couple verses. I want to show you something in regard to the description of the Father before we go back to Revelation. Going to Daniel 7, 9, I watched till thrones were put in place, and the Ancient of Days was seated. The Father was seated. His garment was white as snow. This is a description of the Father. His hair of his head was like pure wool. His throne was a fiery flame, its wheels a burning fire. So here we're given the description of the Father, the Ancient of Days. A description where we're told his head is literally like pure wool. His garment is as white as snow. Now going back to John's description of not the Father, but the Son of Man. Listen to how he describes him. In verse 13. In the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with the garment down to the feet, and girded about the chest with a golden band. Verse 14. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like a flame of fire, his feet like fine brass as refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. Understand, the description that is given of Yeshua here is like that of the description that's literally given in Daniel of the Father, of the Ancient of Days. In other words, my point is, is his, the Son looks exactly like the Father. Right? Looks identical to the Father. And this shouldn't be a surprise because going back to what Yeshua said to Philip, if you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Now John goes on to further describe what he saw in verse 16. And he says, he had in his right hand, now this is significant, the placement of the stars. The right hand in Scripture is significant of power and of blessing, of honor. 
of valor. You look at all over the place. Yeshua is actually called the right hand of God. He sits at the right hand of the Father. When Yaakov, Jacob, was blessing Joseph's sons, whom he said, they are my sons, he moved his right hand to bless Ephraim, to give him the preeminent blessing. Right hand is very significant. He had in his right hand seven stars. And out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was like the sun shining in its strength. So John sees this son of man figure in the midst of seven lampstands. And he's holding seven stars in his right hand. Now, we'll deal with these lampstands, the imagery of the lampstands and the stars in a little bit. What I want to focus on right now is this two-edged sword in the mouth. In the, in the mouth of the Messiah. You know, this is somewhat peculiar to witness a double-edged sword literally in the mouth of the Messiah coming out of the mouth. What does this mean? Now, this is all metaphorical. The lampstands are metaphorical. The stars are metaphorical. The whole book's metaphorical. This sword is a metaphor. But what does it represent? I mean, because what an awesome sight to see. Literally, this double-edged sword coming out of the mouth of Yeshua. Well, if we go to the book of Hebrews, we find the writer uses this phrase, double-edged sword. This is awesome. And it basically answers our question in regard to what it would represent. In Hebrews 4, verse 12, For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirit and of joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So we see here that the writer of Hebrews, he actually likens the word of God, he utilizes the imagery of a double-edged sword, having literally the profound ability to divide things that cannot be divided, things that are normally not dividable, such as the soul from the spirit. See, because that's what the word of God does. It divides light from darkness. It tells us good from evil. Read later on in Hebrews as you get into 5 and 6. It makes it abundantly clear. So literally what we see John is seeing as the sword is in Yeshua's mouth, right? It's the word of God. It is literally the word. It's his word. And this imagery that John saw, this was something that was clearly understood in the first century. It is fascinating that when we talk about lampstand and these stars that are in his hand, they're metaphors, that later on, as you're going to discover, Yeshua comes right out and explains to John what these are. He tells them what they are. He just gives them the flat-out answer. He does not do so with the sword. Why? Because this is something John understood. He knew exactly what this was. Evidence of this is seen right here in the writer of Hebrews. Let me give you some additional information. Ephesians 6 verse 17, Paul says, And take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. The sword, obviously, with Jewish believers in the first century, they likened Torah to a sword, a weapon, a double-edged weapon, knowing that it had the ability to divide the undividable, to pierce through it so that we can know good from evil that the elect would not be deceived. So this double-edged sword in, in verse 16 uh, that we read about is in fact the word. But the most important aspect of, uh, to this sword, at least from my perspective, is what the sword is doing. What is it doing? There's an action put to this sword. It's proceeding from Yeshua's mouth. The action of this sword is something to take note of. What does it tell us? Because there's an action. It tells us judgment is coming. The sword is coming out of his mouth and judgment is coming. That's what his word does. Let me fast forward in Revelation to chapter 19 verse 11. And listen to what he says. Now I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat on him was called faithful and true and in righteousness... He judges and makes war. His eyes were like a flame of fire and his head were many crowns. He had a name written that no one knew except himself. He was clothed with a robe dipped in blood and his name is called the Word of God. 
And the armies in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, followed him on white horses. Now out of his mouth goes a sharp sword, that with it he should strike the nations. And he himself will rule them with a rod of iron. He himself treads the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. So why does why is John seeing a sword proceed from his mouth? It's coming forth from his mouth. Because he is unleashing wrath. He is going to unleash judgment against those who are not following him. Let me take it to Psalm 96, 13. This is a prophetic passage of the coming of Yeshua. It's prophecy. And the psalmist says, For he is coming, for he is coming to judge the earth. He shall judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with his truth. This is how he's coming to judge. This is the sword. He's coming to judge in righteousness. And biblically defining these things, what is righteousness? Psalm 119, 172, all your commandments are righteousness. And it says his people with truth. What is truth? Psalm 119, 142, your Torah is truth. Your law is truth. This is what he's coming to judge. You know, to say that the the commandments of God are no longer valid, that Torah is no longer valid, doesn't work. Because he's coming back to judge with this sword. He's going to take the sword out of its sheath. And people are going to be destroyed because of this word. It is his word. In fact, we find as Yeshua is speaking, getting ahead of ourselves a little bit, as he's speaking to the church at Pergamos, listen to what he says, the warning he gives them. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. Which thing I hate, repent, or else I will come to you quickly and will fight against them with the sword of my mouth. This is how he comes. And so this is what John is seeing. He's literally seeing a sword coming out of his mouth. Terrifying. This whole event is absolutely terrifying. Now as we continue, John's going to go on to describe his response to literally witnessing this son of man figure who is standing in the midst of of seven lampstands, holding seven stars in his right hand, literally said to have uh, hair and head as white as snow. His eyes are a flame of fire. He's girded about the chest with a golden band and he has a sword coming out of his mouth, a double-edged sword. So how does he respond? And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead. Reasonable response, I think. Considering what he just saw here. Fell at his feet as dead. It's exactly how I would respond. But he laid his right hand on me. Again, significant. The right hand shows favor. This is why he extended his right hand to Yochanan, or John. He laid his right hand on me, saying to me, Do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am he who lives. Listen to this. I am he who lives and was dead, and behold, I am alive forevermore. Fascinating. This is a play on words. To a title that has been ascribed, which is given to the Father and to the Son. Who is, who was, and who is to come. This is a play on words. This is brilliant and crafty by our Lord Yeshua. Look at this. In in verse 18, he says, I am he who lives, I am he who is, and was dead, who was, and I am alive forevermore, and will always be. It's a play on words. That deistic title that was given to the Son. So awesome to see this. He goes on to say, and I have the keys of Hades and death. Now, Hades is the Greek term for grave. Not hell, as we think. Grave. It's the equivalent of the Hebrew Sheol. We find that, that in, in, in throughout the Hebrew Scriptures for grave. So he says, I have the keys of gra- the grave and of death. This is what he has the keys to. But what does that mean? To possess the keys to Hades and death. Well, if you look at Matthew 16, I didn't put it up here, but Yeshua, he's dialoguing with Peter, right? He's dialoguing with him and he tells him, Peter that, hey, I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. This is an awesome statement. What did that mean for Yeshua to give Peter the keys to the kingdom of heaven? 
He was literally given the power of heaven. The next statement he makes, he says, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. It will be established. When he, give, when he gave those keys, he gave Peter the power of heaven. He empowered him. Obviously, we know this happened through the giving of the Holy Spirit. So what is Yeshua saying here? He's saying, I have the power over the grave and over death. And the Apostle Paul gives a great commentary on this. We find in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 54, So when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. Now look at the same terms. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? Very two same words that are being used here, death and Hades. Where are, where's the victory? He goes on to say, the sting of death is sin. The strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us victory through our Lord, Yeshua HaMashiach. Yeshua gives us the victory. He's the one holding all the cards. He's the one holding the keys to death. Amen? This is exactly what John is conveying in, in Revelation 1.18. Now moving on to verse 19. Yeshua begins to give instructions to John here. And he says, Write the things which you have seen and the things which are and the things which will take place after this. Here we go again. Do you notice this? We find a crafty and beautiful play on words. Specifically in, in regard to that title, that was ascribed to both the Father and the Son, the one who is, who was, and is to come. And now again in verse 19, with the things that are to be spoken to them, we find the exact same format being used here. Look at what is said here. The first statement, I'll underline it. Write the things which you have seen. In other words, which have happened. This is past tense. Write the things which you have already seen. This is past tense. The second statement, he then moves on to say, and the things that are. Meaning the things that exist now, okay? And then we get into the last statement, and the things which will take place after this. In other words, those things that are going to take place in the future. So this wonderful passage, consisting of three explicit statements, again, is a play on words, on that title of him who is, who was, and is to come. Furthermore, the passage reveals to us something very, very important regarding those things that are written in the book of Revelation. And what is that? Well, it indicates that there are some things that, that are written in this book that existed during his days, that were taking place during his days. It also signifies that there are things that were going to take place but furthermore, there are going to be some things that are written in Revelation that have already happened. Do you understand? This is, look at this passage, and it makes it abundantly clear there are things that have already happened in the past that are and will be. And so, very important piece of information, if you want to go study Revelation, this needs to go right to the top of your list for downloading. To have this in mind as you go and you read all these amazing metaphorical prophecies filled with all these metaphors, you better have this locked and loaded. Let me give you an example of Revelation actually in a prophetic way. And it's, a total, it's, it's totally presented in a prophetic manner, but it's speaking of something that happened in the past. Read, go home, read Revelation 12. And you will find it's a revelation. It was, it was a prophetic, uh, presented as a prophetic as though it were going to happen in the future, but it already happened in the past, of the coming of the Messiah. His first coming. Talking about a child being born, which we read about at the beginning of the Matthew and the beginning of Luke. And that was Yeshua. And then the dragon being enraged, going to kill that child, standing at the foot to kill that child, waiting for it. Read Matthew 2. We already covered this. We know the whole story of Matthew 2 and how Satan would come in and Herod, through Herod, would attempt to kill baby Yeshua as his salvation is literally brought forth into this earth. Revelation 12 is about something that already happened. It's a past event. So very important to identify this passage when entering into the book of Revelation. Now moving on to verse 20, Yeshua is going to give John a clear understanding 
of what those lampstands and what those stars are in the midst of his right hand. Revelation 1.20, the mystery of the seven stars which you saw on my right hand and the seven golden lampstands. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches. And the seven lampstands which you saw are the seven churches. So here it's plainly revealed what the imagery represents regarding the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars. Now, I want to talk about this imagery a little bit. And I, I want to begin with addressing these seven stars that are mentioned. There's some debate as to what these stars represent. I mean, because two, there's really two camps. Some people believe that the stars represent pastors, actual men, physical men, pastoring, rulers of synagogues, what have you, but they believe that they're actual messengers, they're overseers of the church in the flesh, where another group believes that, wait a second, no, no, no. What is actually being talked about is that these are angels. These are angels who are set to oversee these churches. Angelic beings, literally from heaven. Well, which is it? Well, I don't get too worked up about this debate at all. But let me just share a couple things of, of interest to you. Number one, the word used here in Revelation for these angels is none other than angelos. Angelos, or angelos. And the definition is pretty basic. It simply means messenger. Okay? Generally supernatural, messenger from God, an angel conveying news or behest from God to men. Now, something you should know is that nearly, liter almost literally every single time this word is found in the New Testament, with very few exceptions, such as Matthew 11, where Matthew 11 is, is, is about John the Baptist, Literally, it's used of him. And, and, and mirroring that prophecy that says, Behold, I will send my messenger before me. He will prepare the way before me. The word for messenger that is used of John the Baptist is angelos. It's, it's that same word. But nearly every time we find this word being used in the New Testament, it's always of divine angelic beings. Beings from heaven. All right. Furthermore, when we look at the book of Revelation, every single time, of course we can, we could except for the passage in question perhaps, every single time John uses this term, it refers to divine angelic beings from heaven. So whether you want to consider uh, these individuals who are here in Revelation as actual divine angelic beings or actual men, to me it's not that big of a deal because why? They're both servants of God. And they're both been called to do something. Amen? So whether they're angelic beings or, or in the flesh, I, I'm not going to get too worked up about it. But as far as these lampstands are concerned, we're told that the seven lampstands are in fact the seven churches of Revelation, which as you see here, you got Laodicea, Philadelphia, Sardis, Thuadira, and Pergamum, Smyrna, and Ephesus. Here's John over here in Patmos. These are the lampstands. But the looming question is, are these seven churches, and the letters literally addressed, that are addressed specifically to them, are they exclusive to the churches themselves? Now this is a very important question for me to answer, considering we're going to be diving into the seven churches next week. Or, does this have a deeper context that exists. In other words, what I'm getting at, is it possible that these seven churches in and of themselves operate as symbolically, if you will, for the church as a whole? Is that possible? Well, let me give you my answer up front. I do believe that these seven churches that are mentioned here, they are symbolic of the entire bride of the Messiah. And let me support this with some, with some thoughts here and let you be the decider. When John actually turned and looked at Yeshua, we go back in Revelation here, and, and, and he was looking at Yeshua, he notes specifically that Yeshua, he's literally standing in the midst of the lampstands, literally in the center, if you will. The imagery would suggest... Without question, the imagery would suggest that they are all one. Yeshua is literally in the midst of them, right? And that they are all one. 
Well, let me take you to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. Let me read this to you. For it is fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings for both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one. For which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren. And again in John 14 verse 19, a little while longer, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me because I live, you will live also. At that day you will know that I am in my Father and you in me and I in you. There are, many, there are dozens of examples I could give you of us literally being one, achad, with the Messiah. We know that the body of Messiah, he is the what? He is the head. We're all one. It's all one body. He is the head, but it's all one body. Amen? The second thing I want to mention is, notice the imagery that's actually utilized for the seven churches. Deliberate, no doubt, right? It's lampstands. And I think this is significant when you consider what we're dealing with because what is the purpose of the lampstand? Give light, right? I want you to think about that. What did Yeshua say to his disciples in Matthew 5 verse 14? You are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. Again in Ephesians 5 8, For you were once darkness, but now you are a light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. So this is the whole point of the lampstands. They give light. Now we know they only give light because why? He's in the midst of them. He's in the midst of them. We cannot give light apart from Yeshua. He is the light. And what John 15, uh, John 15, 5, apart from me you can do nothing. We cannot give light apart from him. The only reason we give light is because he lives inside of us. Amen? I think this is significant. When analyzing what's going on here, let me share with you another, a third reason. Notice the number of churches that are mentioned in Revelation. There's seven. Now, do we really believe that this was all the churches that existed in the times, right, or during the days? Well, that answer is, of course not. There were churches spread out all over the place. But what's even more peculiar is, is that there were churches right next to these seven churches. What about the Colossians? Right? What about the Colossians? Colossae was right next to Laodicea. Right next to Laodicea. What about the Colossians? Are they not part of the body of the Messiah? The reality is that the number of the churches is significant. And, and, and that number seven we see everywhere. The whole book of Revelation. We have seven stars, seven spirits of God. Right? You have seven eyes on the this, on this stone, seven eyes on the Lamb. Seven eyes on the stone, Zechariah, seven eyes on the lamb, seven trumpet blasts. You have seven bowls of wrath, right? All these sevens, what does seven represent? Okay, so when I'm looking at seven lampstands, what does seven represent? In Scripture, it represents completion, fulfillment. Let me give you an example. Think about creation for a second. How many days did it take the Lord to create the heavens and the earth? It is not six days. Yes, he did all the work on six days. Go back and read Genesis. Creation consists of seven days. It was made perfect. It was made whole. It was brought to its fullness. Okay? So just looking at creation, this is the mirror, I think, of what we are literally seeing here in the exact number of the, the lampstands uh, that is given in Revelation. You look in Revelation itself, it talks about seven bowls of wrath. What's it say? In them, seven bowls of wrath, in them, the wrath of God is complete. It's fulfilled. And we, I give you other many examples, such as unclean bodies. You touch a dead body, you look at the Torah, you touch an un, a, a unclean body, what happens to you? You're unclean until what? The seventh day. Right? You wash on the third day, you wash on the seventh day. And then you are clean. So all over the place, seven is representative in Scripture as completion, as fulfillment. One other noteworthy thing in regard to seven. Now, you know, I struggled with even presenting this because what I'm about to show you is a whole sermon in itself. And, and I, I was really going to build a whole sermon around this, and I just didn't. But Isaiah chapter 3 and Isaiah chapter 4. There is a very obscure and bizarre prophecy that Isaiah speaks of. 
which ultimately comes to, uh, uh, to the divine revelation of the Messiah Yeshua, I want to share this divine obscure prophecy with you because I believe it corresponds directly to the seven lamps that we're seeing. Look at what this says. Revelation 4 verse 1. In that day, seven women shall take hold of one man, saying, we will eat our own food and we will wear our own apparel. That's an interesting statement that seven women... They're coming to one man saying, we'll eat our own food and wear our own apparel. Do you know what Torah talks about in Exodus 21? It talks about the requirements of a husband to give to his wife, which are mentioned right here. He is to feed and clothe her. And this is the very thing that they're saying, regardless of these, we'll provide these for ourselves. Don't worry about it. We just want to be called by your name. Look at what it goes on to say. Only let us be called by your name to take away our reproach. And that day the branch of the Lord shall be beautiful and glorious. Obviously speaking of the Messiah Yeshua. And the fruit of the earth shall be excellent and appealing for those of Israel who have escaped. Here you have seven women coming. Obviously representative and symbolic of what? The body. Being redeemed by a husband. By a savior. Absolutely beautiful. And, not but la- uh, and, and last but not least, you know, I believe these seven churches are representative of the, of the body as a whole because of the message. When we go over the next couple of weeks and we look at the messages, you're going to discover something. It's for the entire body of the Messiah. It wasn't just specifically to Laodicea or to Philadelphia. Now, do I believe that there was application In John's day, absolutely. But if you ever study biblical prophecy, you know how prophecy works. There's an application of that day and a much greater application that follows afterward. Just read. Go through Isaiah. You find this time and time and time again. So with that said, we're going to close. Yeah!